New contradictions emerge from divorce records for Scott Desjardins. Governor Haslam has granted a little more time to make a tough decision regarding the Affordable Care Act. The effort continues to make Chattanooga whiskey in Chattanooga. And have you signed the petition to secede? A lot to cover tonight on Tennessee Insider. Welcome to Tennessee Insider. I'm your moderator, Greg Glover. Please say howdy to our insiders, Nordia Epps, anchor and reporter for WDEF News 12. Dave Flesner, business editor for the Chattanooga Times Free Press. Also Clay Bennett, editorial cartoonist at the Chattanooga Times Free Press. And sitting in for Robin Smith this week is Weston Wong. He is director of communications for the Lamp Post Group. You may have seen him on television a few times this year as well. We may have discussed him at this very table, as a matter of fact. Thanks for joining us, Weston. Just days before the November 6th election, the Tennessee Democratic Party requested records of Congressman Scott Desjardins' divorce proceedings. Those records were not made available in time for voters to consider the sworn testimony that was made public this week. The Times Free Press reported on Thursday that in addition to contradicting a recent statement to his supporters, the congressman also admitted in the sworn testimony that he and his ex-wife agreed to terminate two pregnancies before their marriage began. The court transcript also revealed additional improper relationships with patients. What does this mean for the congressman's future in politics? And since Chris Carroll in the Times Free Press did uh, most of the reporting on this that I've read, Dave, we'll begin with you. How about this story? It keeps unfolding, huh? Yeah, now we've got the full disclosure of all the transcripts that came from the divorce proceedings, which were sealed before, and they finally became unsealed. There was a hearing on this the day before the election, not exactly what a congressman who's up for re-election wants to do, sitting in court the day before election, but that's where he was. He was fortunate enough, I guess, as subsequent events revealed, not to have these revealed before the election. I'm sure the Democrats who have been accused of trying to politicize this greatly and work on his personal misfortune, and to some extent they certainly have, but had this been out earlier, there might have potentially been, at least in the Republican primary two years ago, but maybe in the Democratic election this year, a, a bit different outcome. Um, you know, this is sort of a sad case where you had uh, individuals with some very troubled marriage 12 years ago. The question is whether the voters think that something that happened 12 years ago is important now or not. Um, you know, he's been a little less than forthcoming. You know, he said he didn't make one of the tapes of, of this uh, incident where he encouraged one of his girlfriends to have an abortion, although he later said she was never pregnant. She was just trying to force him into the issue. But in the subsequent hearing of the transcripts, we find out he, in fact, did say that he personally recorded along with his wife and in this sort of sort of the incident that was occurring at that time. So, you know, we did a poll on election day and, and most half the people said it was very important and three fourths said it was somewhat important, the personal faith and, and, and character of what candidates are. But in this case, it seems like in the fourth district, as long as he was a Republican, I think he was able to persuade a majority of people to vote for him. So we'll see in two years if it, that Republican leaning district remains that way or not. Nordia, Dave mentioned he was in court uh, the day before election mm -hmm. day, so, but it didn't seem to sway voters that took part in the election. It didn't, and I really don't think that it would have had it been released ahead of time because I really think that the voters who support him are, have the argument that this happened 12 years ago he has changed. You know, the people who we spoke with, even on election day, were saying, I don't believe it, or it doesn't matter, why did it come out now? You know, it just seems like this big political stunt. But I feel like even if there is kind of proof in front of them, I don't really think that they'll, they'll care. I do think, however, that, you know, we spoke with uh, Congressman Womp, ex-Congressman Womp, uh, and uh, right after the election, and he said, this is going to obviously stick around, which we're seeing happening, and he's going to keep getting hammered, and you know, so he really needs to make some kind of decision. Desjardins does on, um, am I going to stay in the race, or am I just going to leave? Because you know, it's it's not going to let up, and he's not going to really get a chance to to do what he's elected for with all this pressure being placed on him. And of course, we've got the whole issue of the ethics investigation that comes with sleeping with patients, which he has admitted to do. So, just a lot still out there. Weston, talk about if he makes it to the next primary cycle. Is this something that fellow Republicans would jump on to, to try to get the upper hand in a primary battle? I hope he doesn't make it to the next primary. Uh, this is 
Uh, it's unfortunate. It's sad, like Dave said. Uh, a lot of this began as hearsay, and I think that's part of the reason that at the end of the day, in a Republican-leaning district, a lot of the voters said, you know, I'm not going to hold that against him. Maybe I don't know enough. This is obviously why Democrats wanted this news out there. They wanted the court records unsealed because this is damning. This is, uh, I think, much more evidence that he is, frankly, kind of a creepy guy. And, and, and there's a hard, it's hard to read what Chris Carroll and Kate Harrison uh, you know, showed in the paper today and not feel like this is a guy who's, first of all, it really hurts, damages the credibility, not only of his party, but of our state. Because I'll be honest with you, in Washington, we send nine people from the state of Tennessee as our delegation to represent us. And w regardless of the party that they come from, when there's behavior like this, and he clearly misled voters in, in how the process went down and what actually was said, and you now see the revelations are that, in fact, he had encouraged her to have abortions, and it was all, you know, there were things that were recorded by he and his wife. So it's a messy, ugly situation. The way this used to always work, uh, and I think the way that Speaker Boehner probably will handle it is he'll, I hope go eye to eye with Desjardins and say, if these things are true, uh, we really can't have this in our party. I would hope that Democrats wouldn't uh, have that in their party, at least at the highest levels of government. So I don't think he'll make it to the next primary, and if he does, he'll get beat. Clay, it certainly does, does nothing to improve the image of politicians from voters of either side, does it? Well, look, you know, everybody has hard times. Uh, marriages break up. Uh, um, I think that in cases like uh, uh, Desjardins, where he's made his reputation off being sort of pr very pro-life and very traditional family values kind of guy, uh, it's more of a case of hypocrisy than it is the transgressions themselves. Um, when what you do in your private life runs contrary to the, your, your public persona, that reeks of, uh, you know, sort of uh, disingenuousness. Um, I mean, family values, I mean, what family, the Hefners, uh, you know, I, I don't exactly know what family values he was professing, but um, yeah, he, uh, I think creepy was a, was a, a nice adjective for him. Uh, beyond creepy, he's now had multiple patients, co-workers, uh, several co-workers, uh, a pharmaceutical saleswoman. I, I don't think there was a woman that walked into his office that, uh, you know, probably felt safe. Um, I think, though, in this kind of Bible Belt, there are people out there who are willing to believe that people change. And as far as, you know, all these revelations that came forward, they were all from 12 years ago. So I still think that there are people out there who are going to latch on to this idea, hey, people change. This happened 12 years ago and still support him. But much like every scandal that we see, especially in politics, it's not usually the sin that gets you. It's the cover-up, Dave. He, he was untruthful in defending himself. Yeah, unless it? he didn't remember or something, but he clearly said he didn't tape this one conversation, and the record seems to indicate that he did. You know, he didn't, he's been less than forthcoming, and he hasn't had any public events. I think people that, you know, get out and admit that they did wrong and ask for forgiveness, we're a very forgiving country, and, and, and I think especially if it's a use, sort of a youthful indiscretion that people may have made. This is, also, after all, though, when he was a 36-year-old uh, Army veteran, physician, chief of staff for Grandview Hospital, when all this was going on, this was in the mature part of his life that these unfortunate circumstances were going on. Um, I think he's got a lot to answer for, and he's not giving answers. All right, we have a lot to get to in this show, so let's move ahead. Today was supposed to be the deadline for states to decide on a key component of the Affordable Care Act, but late on Thursday, the Department of Health and Human Services extended that deadline for states like Tennessee to decide whether they will set up a state-run health insurance exchange or whether they'll leave that task to the federal government. Governor Haslam is in a difficult position. If the state sets up the exchange, critics will accuse him of implementing Obamacare. If he defers, he could be accused of leaving the health care choices of Tennesseans in the hands of Washington bureaucrats. Weston, uh, several governors, several Republican governors have come out to say, we're not going to do it. What do you think Haslam's going to do in this time that he has? Well, done? Republican governors, I think, have done both. Mm -hmm. I don't know that this is a Republican or Democrat issue. You could say maybe it's a state's rights thing. I think governors like Governor Haslam, who's a business guy, I think he's trying to figure out, okay, how are we actually going to come out of this thing um, losing the least amount of money? How are we going to provide a service to the citizens um, the best way? And I think this is a very honest effort, and it's a really complicated, uh, in some ways convoluted process uh, because they don't know all the details about the regulations. But 
I, I trust that he's sorting through it. And I think it's probably fair that there's an extension here because there seems to be governors from both parties going in both directions. Mm -hmm. Clay, what's the reason for the extension today? Do you well, think? two years was just not enough time, <laughs> apparently, to make this decision. Um, uh, so another week uh, <laughs> should do it. Um, I, look, I, I, I think that he's, he's, he's probably polling everybody in Nashville to see if he's going to get any uh, real opposition um, out of the General Assembly. I wish that he wasn't, you know, that cowardly, but um, we'll see. I, I, think he should, I think he should embrace it. Look, the election pretty much decided the fate of Obamacare. Uh, uh, the state can either take responsibility for the exchanges or leave it up to the feds. Um, and, and he described it as picking the lesser of two evils. How is offering insurance to those who cannot or do not have insurance an evil? Yeah, I, I just don't see that. Um, so we'll see, I guess. I want to get to our journalist, but Weston, do you want to battle that, though, Sin, like he was trying to get <laughs> well, you into Well, you know, I knew there. coming in, I'm, I thought about telling the producer, you brought me in with Clay Bell, who is, I, I told him beforehand, he's one of the Womp family's favorite liberals in town. <laughs> he's more clever than I am. He's hurting so, your reputation. You know, the truth play. is, I, there are actually some Republican governors like Rick Scott in, in Florida who uh, were strong opponents of Obamacare, but now are actually doing everything in their power to cover all of their uh, all the citizens in their state. So uh, you're right. This is the law of the land. It appears to be, and, and I don't think you know Haslam says that, and maybe that is uh, to appease his very sure. uh, his very conservative, very Republican legislature. Uh, but yeah, I think he's going to make a decision between one of the two and play ball. And, uh, and I trust that he'll make the decisions better for the state. And Nordia, uh, Clay says that uh, the election was won uh, mm -hmm. and, and should show the way for what's called Obamacare, but mm -hmm. was there enough of a margin to say this is the mandate that the people were asking for? Well, you know, it, it was really close in the general election, so I don't know if we'll say it's a mandate, but it's definitely the law of the land. Um, I do think that, you know, Clay was saying, I'm not sure how much, you know, uh, fighting he'll get or opposition he'll get. I think he's in for definitely a battle because this is one of those polarizing issues that, you know, both sides are going to draw on to, to, to fight. And we know the Democrats are saying, hey, you need to make a decision right now. They sent out a press release just um, today saying despite this, you know, you know, this extension, you need to make the decision right now and you're just putting it off. But um, we know that they don't have a lot of power <laughs> these days. And so the Republicans in the House, I believe, are going to still have, you know, their different opinions within that group. And so he's going to be, you know, kind of battled on whatever side he looks. Um, so my heart goes out to him. <laughs> Dave, I read a column today that said that uh, the president granted the extension so that the editorialists could start hammering governors <laughs> like Bobby Jindal down in Louisiana to, to get him and, to change to give a cartoonist more material probably for next week. That, that's, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you, you're going to, this is the law of the land, and you're either going to have a federal program or a state program. And in Tennessee, you know, we've had some experience with Ten Care and managed care organizations. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, which is based here in Chattanooga, is very strong and wanting to have a state-run exchange because they think they do better in that as opposed to a national model. So, you know, there's some local politics that might enter into this too that Blue Cross certainly would, hoping that Haslam goes with a state exchange versus having the federal government do it. They think they'd work out better and we'd, it'd be more targeted for Tennessee, sort of the state's rights issue that Weston was referring to earlier. All right, and we'll keep our eyes on that topic as it will certainly come up again. Should liquor production be legal in Hamilton County? A large group of supporters joined the founders of Chattanooga Whiskey at the Hamilton County Commission meeting on Thursday to ask the commission to adopt a resolution asking state legislators to allow liquor production in Hamilton County. Will Chattanooga Whiskey eventually be made in Chattanooga? What are the pros and cons of liquor production in Hamilton County? Big questions. Clay, let's start with you. What uh, what do you think uh, is, is the reason that liquor is not produced here? Is it just a hangover? I, I don't know. The pros are I don't have to go nearly as far. <laughs> um, I, I, it, it seems like a crazy debate. Even the debate the other night, the, the, the people, uh, sort of the, 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 the pro uh, Chattanooga whiskey people, you know, voluminous, uh, you know, in support. And there was one Jasper there arguing against it, I think. <laughs> and um, so I don't really see it. I mean, I understand that this is the South and we are, you know, we're kind of pious and all, but, um, you know, it, it is legal to drink. I don't know if uh, the, the county commission would be that alarmed if um, 
if a cigarette factory was coming to town <laughs> or, or if people are alarmed that, you know, people die in cars so we shouldn't have a Volkswagen plant. I mean, the, 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 the arguments against whiskey is that it's a bad thing, that it's uh, damaging, and, and I guess it is to some people, but not to all. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it's never been to me. <laughs> what? Whatever the decision is, it's going to take a while because, uh, as I understand it, when the commission does decide to vote, it'll be either agreeing or not agreeing on an unbinding resolution to send to the state. Then the state has to make a decision on that resolution. Then it comes back to the county commission for the county commission to either approve or not approve, and then who knows what happens after that. Uh, the it's good. wheels so, of democracy, huh? So, you know, I, I'm not sure how quickly this decision will be made, uh, whatever decisions that ends up being made. Dave, uh, this, uh, I think Representative Floyd has said he will not vote in favor of it. This needs six votes in the, in the positive from our delegation to well, move forward? Well, usually when you have right? a local delegation bill, you try to have unanimous support, right. but, I, but I think you just need a majority, and, and they could overcome that, but uh, Representative Floyd says he's against whiskey and doesn't want it made here. Uh, you know, Tennessee, as Nordy was talking about, was really has some Byzantine rules. I mean, I've always amazed my friends around the world when I can tell them that, you know, in Lynchburg has the most famous whiskey in the world. You can't buy the, to consume, but it's, you know, the most famous product in, arguably in Tennessee's history. Tennessee whiskey, you know, the Jack Daniels is made there, but you still can't get a drink there. So, but, but that may make a little bit more sense. At least they get the jobs and the production and not the, the problems of, of those that consume. I mean, it seems like we're the reverse. If, if you're concerned about whiskey drinking and there's legitimate problems with alcohol consumption, to be sure. But you know that's that deals with consumption. But why you would want to shut down production, which produces the jobs and the money that we could, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. Jobs in Weston. I'll give the camera a minute to move mm -hmm. over your direction. Jobs and perhaps a tourist destination. They were talking about the the uh, the, the guys that put this together. We're talking about having a, a building already selected and perhaps making it uh, open for for tourists to to yeah. pour through. Uh, what do you see going on with this as we move forward? Well, these are sharp young business guys, and so for anybody under thirty in Chattanooga. This is ridiculous, okay? There, we laugh about this, and I've tried to build this bridge between young people in our community and politics and political leaders, and this is one of them where I just kind of have to throw my hands up, and I tell them, you know, hopefully, uh, cooler heads prevail, because this is like the height of political grandstanding. I mean, he's right, I've traveled the world, and like it or not, I think we ought to just embrace it. Our state is known around the world for Elvis and Jack Daniels whiskey, and so these are really sharp young entrepreneurs who've got a, a good product, and you know, it's not as if this is some sort of a, a rough crowd of people who's wanting to do, you know, who's like come into Chattanooga and, and wants to give us a bad image. It's really totally the opposite. And so for any young person in Chattanooga, especially those of us who are really involved in our burgeoning entrepreneurial community, this feels like we're like revisiting prohibition almost 100 years later. So <laughs> I, I don't know what the issue is, but I hope for, uh, for entrepreneurial community's sake, for the guys who started the company's sake, and really just so that our forward-thinking community uh, doesn't take a, I think, a real black eye if we somehow r r roll the clocks back a hundred years. I hope that the county commission will overwhelmingly support this and that uh, even Richard Floyd's vote will be, uh, I hope that it will be outnumbered by the Gerald McCormick's <laughs> of the world. All right, let's get one more topic here before we uh, head out for the week. Are you one of over 29,000 who signed a petition asking that Tennessee be allowed to secede peacefully from the United States? While many who signed the, position, the petition at the White House website are from Tennessee, including from Chattanooga, many of the signatures are from other states. The secessionist trend, yes, it's a trend now, started soon after the re-election of the president. What are we to make of this? Does it tell us anything about where we are as a nation, or is it just folks blowing off a little steam? Nordia, what do you think? <laughs> uh, apparently all 50 states have petitions going these days, and they've mar uh, surpassed the number of, uh, you know, uh, signatures that are needed to at least have the White House respond. Um, you, you know, it's interesting. I think they're just trying to blow off steam. Obviously, this isn't going to go anywhere. Um, and they were upset about the way the election turned out and want to blow off some steam and, uh, you know, more power to them. Dave, Judge Scalia wrote uh, in, in letters between people that it's not even constitutional anymore for uh, a state to peacefully <laughs> secede. Do, uh, do these folks sign I a petition? I think we tried that, that once before. We yeah, had a little war yeah. right here in Chattanooga <laughs> over that. But, you know, I, th 
this is an emblematic, I think, of the vitriolic talk radio and websites that exist out there. Unfortunately, there are fringes on both sides and people, they just take it so far and to be that unpatriotic, you just want to give up on America because your candidate didn't win, I think is, is rather sad. Clay, what do you make of, of all this? Is it a much ado about nothing? Fringes on both sides. I, I love how, you know, we we've, we've always build these false equivalencies. I, I don't remember anybody on the left, uh, you know, wanting to secede when, you know, George Bush was uh, re-elected president in 2004. Now, a lot of people personally wanted to leave, but they weren't going to take their state with them. Um, well, I don't know. I have good news for the secessionists that psychiatric care is covered under a Obamacare. And so, uh, you know, perhaps that's the answer. Uh, you know, it, it's hard for me to take these people seriously. Does it, does it uh, seem cathartic, though, to type your name into a, a line on a petition? Is that, is that what you think maybe they're doing? It seems something. Uh -huh. uh, you know. Uh, Weston, you know. cut him off before he says something that gets us in trouble. What do you make of the secession? I don't think it's serious. It's a country of over 300 million people, and this is uh, several thousand, obviously, very fired up, misguided individuals, but we're in this thing together. All the Clays and Westons are in this thing together. So. I don't take it too seriously, even though I did notice that about a third of my Facebook friends were all moving to Australia or Canada the night after the election. So. But, you know, and after the election, or during the election, there was this uh, uh, plane company that said that they would give a ticket to anybody who whose candidate didn't win who wants to leave the country. I don't know who all took advantage of that, but it would be interesting There was a weatherman in one of the western states who after the election made sure to uh, show people on the weather map the interstate that drove <laughs> north to Canada in case they were going to uh, hold true to that. And just to show you what this uh, petition uh, movement means, really. We were talking in the green room. There's now a petition on whitehouse.gov from Auburn fans who are tired of their football <laughs> coach. They want to get enough signatures for the president to actually fire Gene Chizik. So <laughs> we'll see if any of that happens. Well, we have a moment here at the end of the program to find out from our panel what issue they'd like to bring to our attention. We call it our insider extras. So Weston, you're our guest. Let us start with you. What's your insider extra? Uh, I don't know how insider it is, but we're going to have a mayor's race. It appeared that we may just have a coronation, but uh, I'm one, I actually like competition. So uh, Rob Healy is a respected Chad Nugent. He's been around for a while, and it appears that he's going to make a run. And I think that's good for the process. He'll go into the thing as an underdog, um, but the right questions will be asked. And I think it'll, it'll draw the community into a conversation we need to have about who's going to lead us, even if it ends up being Andy. And, and, and I hope draws more attention to the fact that a lot of our city council races are contested by really legitimate candidates. And that's, that is really a healthy process of, uh, uh, for, a, for a community like ours to go through. So I'm excited about it. Mm -hmm. okay. Clay, your insider extra. Oh, um, okay. So in the week since the election, 10 days, I guess, um, the GOP has sort of uh, gone through this soul searching uh, of where they went wrong. Now, some people within the Republican Party don't think that there was anything wrong with the message. It was just a failure of their marketing. Uh, but there are some who are actually trying to kind of self-reflect. Marco Rubio is looking at immigration policy, uh, you know, sort of an outreach to Latinos. But the harshest criticism I saw was from uh, Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal, who stated to Politico, and I quote, that the GOP should stop being the stupid party. <laughs> Now, as much as I agree with Jindal and uh, applaud his honesty, it does beg the question, if the GOP does stop being the stupid party, how much of the party will be left? <laughs> so, that's right. And he ends it with that. <laughs> Go ahead, Dave, you're inside well, well, A lot of times we talk about how we want government to act more like a business, and, and that's what was brought about some reforms at Tennessee Valley Authority about six years ago. Now they're starting to operate more like a business. They've got a corporate board structure. They're paying all their executives now business level competitive salaries with other investor owned utilities. Uh, but Jimmy Duncan and some of the other people that have pushed for that reform now are saying these are ridiculously excessive and maybe to so many people they are, but you've got $4 million salaries for the CEO now trying to operate more like a business. So sometimes our reforms, when we want government to operate like business, maybe we don't want all of the trappings of, of, of big business. TVA says they have to do that to operate and, and be competitive, but it's an interesting debate about TVA moving more toward a business model, but then having to pay a lot more for their executives. A case of uh, be careful you get what you ask for. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Nordy, around us out here. Well, I'd like us to, or the state, to take a closer look and do even more with the whole uh, issue of drug abuse, prescription drugs in particular. Um, as we're taping today, we have news out of Bradley County that two Walker Valley High students apparently overdosed. They were found. Um, <coughs> 
uh, you know, passed out and apparently took cough syrup and muscle relaxers. Uh, thankfully survived. One is serious, one is stable, we understand. But, you know, there's a lot of talk, obviously, this is a huge problem and the state's trying to do some things and, you know, I'd like to see that continue. We have uh, so many stories about farm parties that kids are into these days. P-H-A-R-M. Yeah. It's Skittles, a problem. Mm -hmm. you know. Uh, one last note here, uh, sitting in for Robin occasionally, you've seen Emily Beatty in that seat uh, speaking to us uh, uh, conservative issues from Cleveland. She recently gave birth to a little baby girl, her name's Sophia. We wish her and her husband congratulations and can't wait to see that little girl. Maybe she'll be sitting in for some of us here on the table eventually. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Tennessee Insider. If you'd like to follow us online, you can sure do that. Find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter as well at Insider WTCI. Of course, you can email us. We're at insider at WTCITV.org. Thank you for joining us. Have yourself a great weekend. For a copy of this program, call 423-702-7800 or email at videoservices at wtcitv.org.